All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are seeing a lot of attendees joining in today. Uh, we will be waiting for a few more minutes to wait for the other attendees to join in. And yeah, we will start in a few. Thank you. Oh, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joel, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon on customer experience for revenue. Thank you for joining us today as we talk about how to increase your revenue with better customer experience. And this event is brought to you in partnership with WSO2. Now, before we start, I just want to go over a few some a few house rules. So first, uh, this is a panel discussion. So we would like to invite you to join the discussion. Uh, you can type in your thoughts, comments in the discussion chat widget below. Secondly, the floor is open for your questions. Our panelists will be answering your questions, so please feel free to do so and send your questions in the Q&A widget below, and we will get back to you at the end. And lastly, with the first two house rules in mind, this webinar is going to be recorded. We will be sending a copy to all the attendees via email uh, so you can view it later. All right. So before, before I pass it on to our moderator and the panelists, uh, we do have... Um, a quick poll that we want to share with you. Uh, let me just open this quickly. Yeah, yeah. So on your screens, you can see the polls there. So we want to know how this webinar can help you. So there's a question on your screen. So please feel free to answer uh, the poll there. And we are going to open it for a few more seconds. And the first question is how have you begun collecting data for the purpose of improving your customer experience? You know, in the in the realm of data, it's really important, you know, on how you can collect and how you can better utilize your data. And for the second question is, is improving customer experience a key focus in your company? You know, even if we have the data, we always need to make sure that we use the data to, to its good use and make sure that we provide a really good like feedback and experience to our customers. So we'll keep the poll open in a, for a few more minutes, a few more seconds, sorry, and then we will get back to you in a little bit. All right, we can see for the first question, have you begun collecting data? A lot of people are asking yes, yeah, are answering yes. And for the second question, is improving customer experience a key focus in your company? Um, let me just share the results here. Yeah, actually, you know, it's, it's, it's always interesting to see that there are a lot of companies out there that are, you know, trying to improve their customer experience. And there are some that it's still, it's still working on it. And yeah, so hopefully you get to learn more about these things in our webinar today. Okay, and without further ado, thank you so much for answering the poll. And now I pass the floor to Christopher. Christopher Star of Catalyst. Hi, Christopher. Hi, Joel. Thank you so much for welcoming me and inviting me again here at E27's webinar series. Again, guys, my name is Christopher Starr and welcome. Today, we're gonna talk about customer experience for revenue. Basically, we're trying to learn how to increase your revenue with a better customer experience. And we are joined by three gentlemen uh, that will help us all to hopefully improve our customer experience. And ultimately, we all want to increase our revenue, especially with during this very challenging times. So I won't um, let you guys wait further. Again, the floor is welcome for any questions you might have. We will try to answer them at the end of the session. Um, so please do send in your questions as we go along. You don't need to wait at the end. Um, but again, um, with the shift of digital posts, both exciting opportunities and challenges for businesses everywhere, I, we all know, including our brand, has gone digital. And one part of that is obviously how do we improve customer experience and how do we increase our revenue? And today, uh, hopefully, we'll be helped by these three gentlemen. Let me start off with um, Kun, the co-founder and managing director of AI Rudder. Kun, would you like to say hi first? Sure. Hello to all of you. 
thank you for joining this um, panel discussion. And I'm Colin from AI Rudder. Uh, what we do is to build voice AI robots supporting over 15 different languages in the region and beyond for businesses in many different uh, industries to solve their customer service, customer engagement, uh, automation issues during pandemic and beyond the pandemic when you have you know, a very large customer base to serve, you have to find some sort of technological solution. And uh, in this case, the voice and language AI. Thank you for that, Kun. And let's also welcome Jay, the product marketing manager of WSO2. Hi there. Um, really, really pleased to be here. Hopefully you can see me and hear me uh, just fine. So my name is Jay Limbarcher. I'm the product marketing manager at WSO2. I've been with the company for just under a year now, working in the identity and access management business unit. I'm a marketer by trade, but I've also got experience in not only identity access management, but contact center, unified comms and cybersecurity. Um, a little bit about uh, the company that I work for, WSO2. So we're a, we're a global company with over a thousand employees. We serve over 800 uh, customers worldwide. Uh, since our inception in 2005, our technology has spanned uh, between API management and integration, as well as identity and access management. Purely from an identity and access management perspective, we manage over a billion identities worldwide. And we're an industry recognized uh, company. So we're an overall leader in Coppinger Coal's uh, leadership compass and a strong performer in the Forrester uh, Wave for Siam as well. So um, happy to be here. Thanks for, for having me. All right, thanks, Jay. And let's also welcome Nadisha, Associate Director of WSO2. Yeah, I'm new. Sorry about that. Hi, hi. Thanks, Christopher. So I'm Nadisha. I'm a solutions architect at WSO2. Uh, I've been with the company for over 10 years, building uh, solutions for our customers um, to build better customer experiences using our products uh, in both integration as well as in identity and access management space. So that's about me. Thank you, Nadisha. And let me jump into my very first question to the three of you. Obviously, we're going to talk about good customer experience and how that leads to revenue, uh, increase in revenue. But of course, I need to understand first, from your perspective, how do you differentiate a good customer experience versus a bad customer experience? Would any one of you like to uh, answer that? Uh, I think. Uh... Two very uh, important you know, criteria for providing uh, so-called good customer experience include uh, the availability and the scalability. So meaning when you want to reach to your um, uh, service providers, you need to talk to them, you need to somehow interact with them and they must be available to you. And many times we see, you know, in so many uh, scenarios where you want to call uh, airlines, uh, uh, telcos and many other companies, you know, you have to wait for minutes, if not sometimes hours in the case of pandemic. And second thing is scalability for, for those uh, companies where uh, they are now serving a much larger customer base uh, than before. And uh, it's simply infeasible or impossible to hire you know, uh, more and more call center reps to scale their business. And not to mention sometimes they need to downsize a little bit because of the seasonality and so forth. So these two are uh, what we think uh, extremely important to provide good customer experience. And if, if you can't do that, uh, customer experience, of course. Thank you for that, Khan. I, I totally agree. I'm a, I'm a, I would say a victim of, of that kind of situation where I have to wait long hours just to wait for someone to tell me that I'll be transferred to another agent, right? I'm pretty sure every one of us probably have experienced that. I hope my bank and my telcos are watching right now to learn from this. Um, Jay, would you like to uh, jump in and talk about good experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a great point that you've just made there, Kun, as well, because I think I think it's really underrated um, um, about ensuring that there's great customer um, service and 
uh, within those. Uh, but for me, like, I, I would say I'm not a fussy customer. I would just say I'm quite a normal customer, but I have some standards that I, <laughs> from, a, from a customer experience that, that I like to sort of say that it's quite normal for, for, for people. So, I mean, I, I, for good customer experience for me comprises of, you know, a, a service that allows me to consume the products and services that I want to consume with minimum effort. Um, I want to ensure that my personal identifiable information, um, my data is secure, um, and that gives me great confidence. Um, you know, I, I would I would say also that um, if I if I'm with a, a, a particular brand for a, a long period of time, I want to be rewarded for for the service that I that I, that I, that I have uh, with with that company, um, and also um, you know just going back to the point that was just made that but to have a really good post. Um, a post sort of service you know sort of customer service uh, process as well so it, provided it's automated that'd be great for me uh, as well so a great example is and I think I'm pretty sure everybody else would probably say the same is you know for me especially Amazon is, is great at that you know it's a smooth on onboarding process they send me promo offers every now and then um, they know what I'm looking for and they give me great you know sort of offers on that um, and they also have a great sort of uh, customer service experience as well and then, right from a from a bad CX perspective, there's a broadband company that I that, I'm, that I've been with for the last six years, and and I like to think that I'm a loyal customer. But every time that there's a renewal date, I have to haggle for, <laughs> I have to haggle for the best price, and I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that that shouldn't be the case. Um, so yeah, that's that's my um, you know what makes a good customer experience and a bad customer experience, and some examples. Thank you for that. I totally can relate to to that experience, uh, and I think that's something also that Catalyst is currently trying to build. We don't have an existing um, loyalty um, program, which I we, we want to jumpstart and, and it starts with collecting data uh, without knowing that otherwise we'll see all customers just the same and treat all customers the same. But as a marketer, I'm pretty sure you know that it's far more expensive to acquire a new customer than to retain a new one. So it makes a lot of sense to, to not just collect data, but also harness that data to better serve the customers. Nadisha, would you like to jump in? So I'll talk from a product standpoint, right? So from a product standpoint, what makes a good customer experience is having a product that is built with customers in mind. So you, you don't really build a product targeting on features, but you, you target or build a product uh, looking at the customer journey, right? How do I make the customer, or how do I make my customer's journey much smoother? Making it uh, easily usable to a 18 year old and a 60 year old. So that's the ultimate customer experience that a product company would want to build. A good example would be Uber or, or um, uh, Grab in, in, in this region where it, the experience is so smooth that even a 15 year old or even my uh, six year old daughter is able to use Uber or Grab to book a cab, as well as my grandmother who's 70 year old can use that, that same app to, to book a cab. So that's, the, that's what I call a great custom experience. Uh, and the, whatever the product that you build, is self-explanatory. So you don't need to go through a demo video or a YouTube guide to, to use that product. So that, that is what a good custom experience is. And on the flip side, a bad custom experience is when you try to overcomplicate your, your, your offering, uh, making it, you, you may have a, have a great set of features, but if you're gonna overcomplicate your offering, it becomes a bad custom experience. If I, if I have to go through a, a YouTube video to figure out how I should do something, then it's a bad custom experience. So that's from a product standpoint, that's where I would put those together uh, as part of custom experience. Thank you, Nadisha. I can also totally relate to that. I'm a big advocate of uh, obsessing on your customers rather than competition, rather than on the newest features. And when you were talking about um, these things, especially on the, the bad customer experience and the product perspective, I can just recall my experience with my banks with, I submit an online application, I go to the bank, I have to fill up another 300 pages of the same information I already submitted, right? It, it doesn't make any sense for me. Um, and, and I think that's a lot of um, experiences of other customers as well. Now, speaking of that, I know we all agree that it's important to have customer experience uh, enhancement so that it really enhances the experience of the customer. But more specifically, I'd like to know, how do you guys help your customers or your clients create that 
for their customers, right? So um, maybe let's start back with you, Najisha, with WSO2, like what do you guys do and to help your customers create that customer experience? Yeah, so we, we do have multiple products in our portfolio, but, but, but one of the products that closely related to building good custom, custom experience is our SIAM offering, um, custom identity and access management offering. Um, the idea, so I'll take a good example, right? So if you, if you look at a bank, uh, most of the banks have multiple channels. They have the internet banking, mobile banking, they might have a, a wallet app as well. Uh, in, and in most cases, they, they do have their own login. So if I use to log into my internet banking, it's one username and password. If I'm going to log into my wallet app, it's a different different username and different passcode, right? So it, that that entire experience becomes very complicated. Um, so that's a bad customer ex experience, of course. And, and what we offer as part of our SIAM uh, offering is where you, 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 you have identity and access management layer that, that uh, kind of enhances this experience. So that uh, if I take the example of the bank, each application doesn't have to manage their own identity. They can pass it on to a common identity and access management solution that, that can do that particular job for you. So that also, um, that also in a way helps that organization to, uh, so that if you have an internet banking, their sole objective is to build a good experience for their internet banking, not to manage their usernames and passwords. So you delegate it to some other product that specializes in doing that, while you have more flexibility and more effort and resources to build a good custom experience. So that's probably, uh, the effort that you need to build a good custom experience, in my opinion. Would you happen to have any uh, a, a case study or a sample client of, you know, like a before and after scenario? Yes, uh, I, I uh, work a lot with banking um, uh, customers in the banking industry. So <clears throat> the, the example that, that I to talked about is, is very common scenario. And that's something that we use to tackle very often where um, banks, um, and it's a security threat as well. So if I had to maintain one passport for internet banking, one for my uh, mobile banking and another for my wallet, I tend to forget them as well. So uh, most of the customers do write them down. So that's a huge security uh, vulnerability for the bank. So um, what we've done uh, in most uh, cases with the banks that we work in the region is we uh, help them to kind of uh, take out the customer identity and access management out of the solution, uh, out of the application in, in this case. And uh, we provide a specialized offering that will allow you to do custom identity and access management while the apps take care of what they do uh, in terms of fund transferring and things like that. And we also allow those apps to be smarter uh, in, that, in that sense. Like for example, if I'm going to do a um, fund transfer within my account, uh, two accounts that, that belongs to me. Um, the level of authentication or the amount of um, um, authentication that needs to be done should be minimum because it's between my account. But if I'm going to do an interbank transfer, transfer to a different account, I should be, um, I should be um, uh, provided I, or I should be challenged uh, with two questions or a password and OTP, for example. So that kind of adaptability should be part of the solution. And it's something that we offer as part of our SIAM platform where we can do adaptive authentication based on a risk profile or based on user's behavior, we change how we are going to challenge that particular user. It can be a single factor, it can be two factors, it can be even three factors based on the risk profile of a user. For that, Nadisha and, and Jay, would you like to chime in? How do you guys help uh, your customers improve or create a good customer experience? Yeah, so just from a sort of a, a bit more of a higher level, how we sort of help organizations. Um, so we've, we, you know, we sort of pride ourselves in a number of different factors at WSO2. We're, we're a very agile company, but we're, we're also a very developer focused company. So we really sort of harness our tool sets to, to uh, equip um, uh, developers to and provide them with the straightforward and simple tools to implement intuitive login experiences so that they can they can build those sort of authentication flows that are that are not just um 
you know, standard out of the box, but really sort of meet the needs of, of their customers. So it's really sort of aimed at that. Um, our approach to any organization, whether you're a startup or whether you're a, a, a multinational company, enterprise, um, we have really the same approach. We sort of take up, we take care in ensuring that the, the, the sort of the business needs are met. So, you know, our largest customer manages over 100 million users, but we also have startups that we that we manage as well uh, and that we help to implement uh, login experiences. I think um, one part is that, you know, we we have a product that sort of truly extends and adapts. So through sort of the API uh, driven architecture, um, it can really help to sort of create um, an environment where we're we're enabling organizations to sort of really meet those unique business cases so um, whether you know <clears throat> you know whether you need to sort of plug into a CRM uh, bring data points together or anything like that that's something that you know we can help with um, and also from a deployment perspective whether you you know as a company or an, as an organization whether uh, you have all of your technology stack in the cloud or whether it's on-prem you know we have really flexible deployment options so from our perspective, you know, uh, we have a, a, a you know a, a, a SaaS based cloud um, a platform. Um, we can also offer services that that help both both on prem and hybrid cloud environments. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So a number of different ways in which we can sort of help those sort of customers from a higher level. Thank you, Zoe. I really like the idea of of, of you sharing. Uh, that you work with startups and even to like millions of, of customers, because to, to Kun's point earlier, part of, of what he describes as good customer experience is scalability. And I think, you know, as as startups scale and grow and, you know, from a few hundred users to suddenly overnight can become millions of users, it's extremely important to have a partner that's, that helps you scale fast enough. And I think that's what you have just demonstrated to us so far. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. And and Kun, would you like to talk more about on the AI perspective? How do you provide uh, or help your clients create good customer experience? Yeah, sure. So actually, we tackle this uh, problem to ensure the good customer experience from different perspectives. The first perspective is to take care of the customers uh, through their journey, from uh, acquisition to onboarding to revenue generation all the way to retaining the customers. So we have, for example, the uh, automated AI uh, uh, telemarketing, telesales leads qualification uh, robot uh, for customer acquisition. And then we have uh, you know, the, the customer activation robot as well to nudge customers to finish the whole onboarding process uh, after they sign up for the service. And uh, during the revenue generation phase, we can uh, help uh, our customers to uh, upsell, cross-sell, or to uh, give some promotion to their existing customer base. And lastly, when uh, those consumers, individuals have some you know, concerns, problems, questions, when they want to get in touch with their service providers, in which case uh, they are our customers, uh, we give them the so-called inbound customer service robot system as well. And the second perspective is more interesting, which is, uh, as I mentioned, the scalability and availability uh, concerns of uh, call centers and the customer experience teams. Uh, we can make currently over 200,000 telephone calls automatically using AI within an hour. So that, that kind of capacity uh, is something that uh, you can't really build uh, in the traditional call centers or any you know, human operation teams. And the last perspective actually is uh, surprisingly the, the comp compliance, uh, which is also uh, something we have to uh, you know, take very uh, carefully in, in you know, customer engagement. Uh, with AI, everything can be predefined, uh, pre-designed, so there's no abuse of languages. There will be no surprise, no you know, unexpected situations going on between the conversation between, uh, you know, among AI and the uh, consumers or customers. Just uh, quickly, since um, our, our brand is a global brand and we obviously have a call center uh, based out of Philippines and we are, we are supported by this uh, company as well in terms of um, language support. For, for AI, uh, voice AI, are you able to also support multiple languages as you mentioned earlier? Uh, yeah, 
this is a very very good question because you know the main another you know main pain pain points I should say for many call centers operated you know globally is they have to you know have people speaking a variety of languages to serve customers in any corner of the world. Uh, in our case, uh, we have supported 15 different languages using AI, uh, our own proprietary uh, AI infrastructure, and this number is counting. This year, we'll support maybe another 15, and that number will, will reach 30. And uh, uh, we not only support you know, different languages for different customers, we can even switch languages within the same telephone call because you know for countries where multiple languages are spoken by many people, you don't really know upfront which language that individual customer really prefers to speak. So maybe we try English first uh, and later we have to switch to another one depending on the context. So these are all possible using AI. And this is also another aspect you know, of the uh, availability, scalability problem again. You know, when, when you have a certain you know, call center rep who can only speak one language but not the other. Yeah. Thank you for that, Ken. Um, I, I can totally relate when I still work for different startups in the region, one of our challenges was obviously uh, customer support. And so we have, I have experience sitting on customer service because certain questions are, at, are are being asked in a local language and nobody in the team can understand what this person is talking about. Uh, and as you mentioned, as you scale, th that becomes a challenge, especially I'm not technically a customer service agent, but I would have to like spend time actually on, on, on a customer service email or, or phone call. Um, I want to, I wonder, because I've been hearing about um, Siam earlier, and, and I don't think anyone has explained it in detail, probably some of them, including myself, I'm not familiar with it. Um, so maybe Jay, would, would you mind telling us about more about what is Siam? Does it stand for something? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think we'll just maybe, so we'll just take a quick step back and, I, and I'll probably try and lay the landscape a little bit and then try and explain how Siam comes into play. So I think, um, we've all sort of been through this horrible COVID situation. Um, so uh, from a customer standpoint, you know, um, you know I think so Forrester, the, the leading analyst, said that sort of 80% of consumers are now turned to digital. So like, um, I think that's pretty evident. So if you go, to, especially in the UK, if you go to, you know, before there was a lot of high street banks where people would sort of go in and, and do a lot of their banking um, situation, uh, uh, banking um, uh, situations. Um, they, they're now sort of being forced to sort of more digital, uh, harness in digital apps. So whether you're technically savvy or whether you're a, a novice to technology, whether you're like Nadisha was saying, whether you're sort of 16 or 60, you need to uh, sort of adapt these, these digital environments, right? But, but from a customer standpoint, they, they kind of expect two things, right? They want a positive and seamless customer experience, user experience um, to their apps, but also they want to ensure that the security is also uh, adhered to based around the local regulations and keeping data safe, right? So, um, you know, th this is really sort of quite interesting from a consumer perspective, from a, from a user perspective. Now, if we focus on the, the business, what it means for them, uh, they have to deliver great uh, and exceptional customer experiences and they have to deliver strong security. Um, they have to provide a seamless omni-channel uh, user experience as well. Um, you know, there's complexities of that surrounds um, the infrastructure around companies that, that are not able to support, provide a unified view and a 360 degree view of their customer base, which means that they're not able to then sort of, as I, I gave my broadband um, uh, situation before, they maybe still don't know who I am, despite the fact that those companies, with those companies, I've been there for about six years. So that's really important. And so a Gartner study also showed that, you know, um, you know, a, a consumer's product, a, a consumer's experience with a product, um, you know, that that drives loyalty more than sort of, you know, haggling on, pro, you know, sort of trumping price or anything like that. So customer experience and, and the data that you derive from from a user's experience uh, uh, and measuring their sort of their, their sort of digital footprint and, and, and accessing that and harnessing that is, is a gr probably the greatest commodity a business could have. Right. Um, so, so from a Siam perspective, you know, come bringing it back to Siam, having laid that that sort of landscape, you know, there's we say customer identity and access management, which is which is abbreviated to Siam. So, the two objectives of Siam really is to you know build an identity ecosystem that turns anonymous users into known users, right? Uh, but also that you can drive the revenue growth uh, 
um, for your business by leveraging the identity data that you acquire from those customers. So those are the two objectives. And then from a clear definition perspective, there's, there's, there's hundreds of definitions, but the ones that we, the one that we use more prominently in WSO2 is that SIAM um, is a customer focused discipline that facilitates leveraging identity data with business data to, to catalyze business growth. Um, so what that enables a business to do is to enable fast and convenient and unified and secure access across digital channels, but also it leverages that customer data to understand the customer better and to tailor products and services that are aligned to their needs. So I can give you a really, really quick example uh, of, of, of how that kind of works, right? Um, being a marketer, um, you know, uh, when we're looking to to, to sort of create person, you know uh, campaigns for our our users, not necessarily here at WSO two, but maybe in the past in other companies, uh, we spend a lot of time data cleansing. So we know that customer X has been here uh, a part of our business. They might have been here for a number of years, and so on and so forth. But with a SIAM in place, a, a customer identity and access management solution in place, you know, you can get that unified view of the customer in a single source of truth to get your campaigns out to market quicker that are not only quick to deploy, but also that, that the campaigns can be aligned to those customers changing needs. And I think from like the contact center perspective, from, a, from what Kun's perspective sort of um, is the fact that you know, um, you know, you're able to provide that 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 repository of information um, quicker to you know um, you know to to serve those customers. So, hopefully, that's given you a bit of a guided tour around Siam, and hopefully, that's explained it in a little bit more detail. Thank you for that, Jay. No, it is very helpful, and and I like the fact that you contextualize it even for marketing. Um, yeah. Obviously, I'm a marketer by by trade. And I totally agree with, with what you just shared. And obviously for those who are also listening or watching right now are also marketers, I'm pretty sure you've heard about the iOS, dreadful iOS 14 update and the move towards you know um, collecting first party data ra rather than relying on third party data. I think it's, it's extremely important to not just pull that information but be able to harness that later on, right? Um, thank you so much for that, Jay. But Nadisha, how do your company uh, specifically implement that for your clients and what makes your service different from other providers you mentioned being but being one of the if not the leading in in your industry but how do you exactly do that um so in terms of how we do it uh, we do have a identity and access management product that that has been there for almost 12 uh, almost 14 years actually um and then uh, what we do as part of or what we offer as part of the product is a fully fledged identity and access management solution um, that target, targets a SIAM market, but we also can do, um, uh, say, uh, B2B, for example, or government to business. So it's a very flexible solution. And the idea is that we, we want to take away the trouble of identity and access management from the applications. So if you are doing a internet banking application, they don't have to worry about identity management. They use our solution to do that. Uh, by doing that, what we do is we are gonna centralize the identity and access management to, to our, our solution. We also provide a layer through which the third party applications can access those services. So for example, if someone wants to account management or, or uh, for example, use a password reset. So we do provide an API through uh, which a third party application within or outside the organization can do a password reset and get get a uh, get a new password um, and if i talk about this uh, adaptive authentication scenario uh, you our product gives you the flexibility to write a script through which you can define what a risk profile is um, say for example i make a transaction uh, uh, to, to a third party account Based on the uh, uh, the admins or, or whoever who's going to uh, define these policies can come in and say, okay, if the transaction value is more than three thousand dollars, you have to go for second factor. If not, a first factor or one factor of authentication is enough. <clears throat> that kind of um, adaptive uh, authentication uh, logic can be implemented, so it can be multi-factor. 
it can even be multi step so you you can you can even give an option so your second factor can be a sms otp or a email otp so we pride ourselves to give that flexibility for an application developer so that it ultimately contributes towards building a good custom experience from application point of view um and then uh, we also uh, have a lot of options and flexibility in terms of strong custom authentication so it can be your fingerprint it can be your facial recognition if, if you are using a mac it can be your mac fingerprint authentication um some organizations want to do passwordless authentication so those scenarios um so rather than you building those logic within the application itself now you pass it on to a siam layer like wso2 which will do that for the application so that's <clears throat> how we can implement uh, a siam solution and what makes us different is we are a 100% open source company everything we do um we do have monthly community calls to figure out what community is doing uh, our products are open source it's free to download and use um so the advantage of having this model is someone who wants to evaluate can simply download the product try it out um and even um, develop on top of it and once they can even um uh, run it in production without a license um and if they want to have a subscription with us uh, to to make sure that they get the latest updates of the product they can then reach out to wso2 and and get a subscription so that's a flexibility you get um as i mentioned we also support multiple different scenarios so it doesn't have to be b2b we can do uh, government to citizen business to business as well so we do have a lot of government institutes using our product a lot of universities using our product to to enroll students and manage students um and apart from that um what uh, additional things that we can offer is uh, uh, from a deployment standpoint it, it can be on premise it can be on cloud it can be even hybrid and now we have a saas offering so that it, it can even be saas in future we, are, we we manage the solution for you and we, we allow you to um, use it as another saas product in terms of identity and access management so that's what we uh, that's the summary of the uh, um, advantages that we offer as part of our product thank you for that natisha and i'm happy to hear that you have this wide range of offerings and it seems like you have everything for everyone from someone who wants something free to start with and build on top of it and and if they need assistance they can also reach out and 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 like the fact that you mentioned about um you know governments are also help, uh, utilizing this and i hope my government's listening right now <laughs> and you to like this as well uh for faster transactions um thank you for that natisha and for kun uh i have a question so we're talking about siam um customer identity and access management right so does your ai also utilize this um kind of service because i imagine in customer service it's always you know the first question is may I have your name your you know email address like customer information does your ai also do that uh, able to pull the data from the siam yeah, I also noticed there's a, a very similar question from uh, from the audience asking about uh, AI and uh, CM and also how AI really can benefit uh, our customers. So uh, very interesting, you know, I, I do believe uh, customer identity management is very important and AI actually can work together with CM to do something to manage uh, the identity for uh, for customers, uh, not only uh, you know for the benefit of the, the the companies we are serving, but also for the end customers themselves. For example, we can use their voice to create a biometrics, and then um, later when they come to us, we can depending on the samples of their voice we we had before to understand with certain high level confidence whether this person is the one we want to talk to. And uh, also we can automate uh, any sort of uh, KYC process as long as the KYC is not so complicated. Uh, uh, 
asking questions about their names and maybe their personal information and for, for our you know customers we are serving. And uh, when it comes to the benefit of using AI, uh, I, I can share with you guys a, 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 a true example. Uh, when we work with a, a fintech company in the Philippines, actually, uh, they, they tested our robots for their um, uh, loan collection finish, and uh, they can immediately uh, notice several uh, very important benefits. The first is the connectivity using AI, because basically you can call your customers anytime you want, then you can lock down the data of connectivity and you pick a better time slot to call different customers. And second thing is better engagement uh, because you, know, you can uh, design quite complicated script and the AI will you know, execute the telephone call to the last detail. So uh, there's no variance in the performance of AI. And lastly, they will compare the repayment rate uh, between AI and uh, their alternative solutions. And uh, we give them around uh, five to 6% increase in payment rate. So that is the reason why they adopt AI immediately from us. So this can all be the benefit in addition to the you know, more high level ones I talk about like scalability, availability, compliance, uh, and so on and so forth. Thank you for that. And, and quickly, just a follow up on this, obviously, um, the, the big question mark here is, um, is there a big difference between AI and, and an actual human um, collecting this information? Aside from scalability, I understand you, you can't quickly, let's say overnight, you need to call a hundred customers. You can't hire a hundred agents, right? But in terms of experience, I think a lot of us have experienced chatbots and I personally am not a big fan of chatbots and gets frustrated and you're like, I just want to talk to an agent, but how about for, for a uh, voice AI? Uh, is it similar to a human being? A very important thing is to build the AI around you know, the core idea of better customer experience. And in this case, we make sure the AI sounds like human. And uh, from all the samples we, we take from the uh, conversations between AI and customers, 99.9% .9 of time, the customers will not realize uh, the agent they were talking to actually was simply a piece of software. And uh, in, in some very few cases where the customer realized they would maybe talk to some uh, AI agents, they would even praise that the, the AI was quite amazing because they didn't realize today's AI really can be built to talk to customers or individuals like you know, the call center rep. Uh, and another thing is actually to make sure that the AI can answer the questions uh, from customers, and we do that through a lot of uh, 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 big data uh, injected into our AI model. Over time, the AI will become smarter and smarter, and 90% uh, of the time, all the questions from customers can be resolved by AI automatically. And for the remaining 10%, we also have the engineering you know, part of our product that can transfer the telephone call in real time to call center reps. Thank you for that. I have a fun question. This is really not not uh, not necessary, but I would like to ask: If I ask the, the the AI agent, "Are you an AI agent?" Would it actually say yes? This is actually, you know, the oh, okay. very very long term mission and <laughs> of our company because we simply believe the voice will be yet another very important interface for human computer interaction. You know, in the past we have keyboards, mice, now touch screen on our cell phone. But you know, the best way for, for us as human beings to interact with machines should be natural language. The problem in the past was that the technology was not there, uh, the machine was not ready, but gradually we can take on more and more business problems using AI. Wow, thank you so much for that, Gun. I would obviously start asking every time I pick up the phone, are you an AI? <laughs> but thank you so much for that, Gun. Now, before we jump into our questions from the audience, obviously, I'm pretty sure, uh, just like myself, I'm very convinced on utilizing and exploring you know, voice AI or Siam in terms of improving customer experience. But maybe, gentlemen, you can share with us how to get started, where to start. Um, maybe we can start with, with Jay. If we're interested about these services, where do we start? How do we start? 
Yeah, so I suppose, um, uh, you know, to, in order to in order to sort of start out, I think it's really important just to sort of um, so if you're just starting out on your SIAM in your sort of SIAM journey, your customer experience journey, I think it's really important that you know uh, you take some basic life principles and, and sort of apply them to, to to the business and business logic. So um, you know, in, in my opinion, you know, first impressions count, um, and so from an onboarding perspective, um, you know, when you want somebody to onboard with your your app or your your, your, your sort of digital um device um you know the tip with Sia from Siam is you know have a very sort of frictionless onboarding process so don't so what you don't want to do is you don't want to provide fields and fields of information that customer needs to that customer needs to sort of um uh, fill out that actually there's a stat out there that says that you know if you've got too many fields that a customer needs to complete and you're being too intrusive in, in the information that, and the detail that 86 percent of users will abandon the registration just go to the next the next service provider so really so the, the the first point is really just only take the minimum amount of information you need to onboard that customer to 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 your to your business or your app um, and then there's this thing called progressive profiling which is turning that unknown user to to a known user but doing it over time so really, this is all about sort of customer journey mapping and understanding at what point you want to take more information from your customer, what you want to find out about them. The key is to make sure that you're harnessing only meaningful information, uh, really from a sort of GDPR perspective and a personal identifiable information perspective. You don't want to be taking more information. You don't want to be storing more information than you, than you need to about that customer as well. So if you if you sort of take that those two principles on board, then over time you'll end up getting that 365 degree view, 360 degree view of the of that customer, um, which will then enable you to then build build on top of of that to to create more sort of mature um, um, and analysis around those customers and provide those services uh, that can add value to them. All right, thank you so much for that, Jay. Nadisha, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, so uh, I think Jay made some very valid points. Like, I, I what I can suggest is you need to keep things very simple. Right? When you start things up, it's, it's all about keeping things as simple as possible. Um, that again contributes to better customer experience, right? So when, when things are simple, it's easier for users to understand and and use your product. Um, one thing, and then uh, when you start up, try to use rather than build. Uh, early it was to be like buy versus build, but now it's with open source and, and a lot of SaaS offerings, it's use versus build. So you try to use what's available, try, trying to rather than trying to build it by yourself. So that's another thing that I want to highlight. That and uh, Kun? Yeah, actually, uh, it's super important, you know, when a sort of new technology appears in in this world we need to make sure adopting such new technology is easy and uh, lightweight enough for businesses and the individuals in our case uh, we will design the solution for our customers and we will have a very uh, thorough uh, trial process to measure the efficacy of uh, AI, voice AI robot from actually uh, four different angles, perspectives. The first is the benefit. Uh, sometimes it's cost saving, sometimes it's about you know, making more money or ensuring the customers are happy. And second is uh, the IT flexibility, meaning it's very easy to integrate our system with the existing CRM or internal systems. The third is a risk control to make sure that the, the system is stable uh, uh, from the engineering perspective and also from compliance perspective. And last thing is education. We need to educate and give tutorial to, to our customers, internal people to allow them to understand how to utilize uh, AI to help them improve their op operational efficiency in their contact centers. All right, thank you so much for that. Gun. Now, before we end the session, we do have a few questions from the audience and also during registration, a few questions were sent in. I think I have about um, a few minutes to answer that. Um, I see something like probably a theme more or less. I think some people are asking about um, how does Web3 could affect uh, Siam? And then there's also a question about um, personal data is still stored uh, through a third party. Maybe you can clarify on that, uh, either Jay or Nadisha who would like to answer that. 
Uh, let me take that. So Web3, how it affects Sam, um, uh, how I see it is it's, it will be another persona for, for Siam, right? So it, it's another aspect to it. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of organizations looking into see this relationship, how, how it can be managed, but how I would see it is, um, uh, so it will be another attribute to what you store, right? So your, your Web3 profile um, may, can be another attribute and it can be another way of uh, authentication and validation. And on the flip side, from Web3 point of view, Siam can be used for um, to, to link your real world pro profile. So if, if you want to say make a payment on a Web3 platform, uh, Siam can be a way of authenticating who you are on the real world. So it may be uh, to, to utilize uh, a physical payment method that you have or to make, make a bank transfer, for example. Uh, Siam can be a way of authenticating who you are and then linking your Web3 profile to, to your physical profile. Uh, on the second question on personal data and uh, whether uh, the solution itself will store that personal data, the short answer is no. Uh, you, you could store it within, within your Siam solution, but also you can use, you can still continue to store it locally in your own CRM, but link your uh, the information that like for example username and password ideally should be in, in siam and then you link them together uh, so in terms of progressing profiling and all that what siam stores is a, a, a simply uh, um, uh, anonymized um, i would say uh, like a primary key to link to your information that resides in the crm and um, so essentially Siam will not store any of your personal information in that case. All right, thank you for that, uh, Nadisha. Uh, there's also a question during registration about if on stage where the product is still not mature enough and still having a lot of room for improvement, well, basically is asking between revenue and customer experience, which one would you prioritize? Um, I would ask maybe Kun for this since you're a founder of a startup, uh, if uh, you're looking yeah, back. Yeah, this is a very <laughs> typical question for uh, startup, startups where you have you know a thousand things to do at the same time. I should say you should still be obsessed with your customer experience because you know when your product is not ready, meaning maybe you only have a prototype or a minimal viable product, you are not yet you know, product market fit, then you need to work very closely with your first 10, what they call the unaffiliated customers, meaning they don't know each other and sell, sell them really well. Hopefully you have raised some funds from investors. So you don't need to really care about the revenue from these 10 customers upfront. And uh, you make sure your product can be better and better until you have this first sort of you know uh, product market fit for a niche uh, segment in uh, in the very maybe uh, hopefully large vertical and uh, revenue actually is something you need to uh, consider later when you want to scale your operations of selling your product to to a much larger group of customers Thank you for that, Kun. I, I totally agree. I think money follows once you have a really good product and service. Uh, so thinking about money first usually doesn't end up really well. Um, I, I guess let's take one last question since still in the, the topic of customer experience. Uh, how do you best build a feedback loop to iterate your customer experience over time? And maybe Jay, you can share this um, with us since you mentioned also about uh, progressive profiling, and I think that's something that, that could help in this area. Yeah, absolutely. So I, th I feel like, um, again, a great example is um, somebody like um, uh, Amazon or, or, or other companies. I, th I, th I feel it's really important to keep your customers engaged um, throughout, the, throughout the process. I mean, we're doing it here, right? We're talking to, we're, we're talking to our, um, uh, the, 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 um, the, the 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 wider audience and we, we were asking them to do some polls and i think that's a great idea of doing it but also we're asking them to feedback questions to us and, and constantly asking for improvements um i feel like you know uh it, today's customer is is a customer that's got a vested interest um not only in the products and services that you consume but also you know how you how you sit within uh you know more so, sort of socio-economic issues such as environment and, and things like that. So really you can you can have a really interesting um, 
uh, a well-designed uh, feedback loop that can always sort of request feedback um, at different points of, 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 of their journey. Um, a bit to sort of come to point as well, when you're sort of starting out your, your, your business as well, it's really important to get that customer feedback and have them as a vested um, and integral part of your, uh, your, 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 your sort of the development of your business as well. So as you grow, uh, you know, um, you know, as they as they sort of consume more services, you know, it's because of their feedback to 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 to, to your to your uh, plans as well. So I feel like there's a number of different th different ways of doing that, and um, I, I feel you just I think it's a key just to sort of know your customer well enough to to know that at what point they want to be to what they what they want to have to be they want to be involved in in, in some of those discussions with you. Um, so yeah, I would say sort of polls, questions, you know. Uh, any sort of post-service um, uh, questionnaires would be great as well. And then you can build that information over time and be quite cute about it. I mentioned before, it's all about taking meaningful information that's going to help you provide better services, better customer experience for your customers. And if you're doing that, then they'll be, then, then your customer base will grow. Thank you for that, Jay. I actually have that similar situation where we sent out a survey and the subject line is pretty simple. Uh, help us help you. And yeah. had a very good... Um, open rate and we got a lot of answers and after some of the answers actually led to new business models or, or new business units in the company and and sometimes a lot of founders since i'm a mentor for a lot of startups here in the philippines are afraid to talk to their customers and i'm like why they're the ones who want to talk to you and you know they, they try to hide their customer service and email they don't want to talk to customers but i think like what you said it's important uh to, at some point you need to engage them uh, to, to help you make decisions. Thank you for, for that, Jay. And uh, I think this concludes our seminar for today. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I think there will be a few words from E27, so please stay tuned before we end. But before that, um, I'd like to thank Kun, Jay, and Adisha for joining me today, and also E27 for inviting us to talk and share with you today. And also thank you especially for uh, WSO2 for sponsoring today's episode. Um, Joel, would you like to take over? Yes, definitely. So Christopher, thank you so much for the very insightful discussion. Once again, thank you Kun, Jay, and Adisha also for giving us some insights and some knowledge on well, how AI and Siam can you know, provide more customer experience. And that will eventually drive you know, bigger revenue for the companies. And during the panel discussion, uh, we actually touched a little bit on the, on WSO2 SIAM solution. So to learn more about SIAM, please feel free to visit their website by scanning the QR code on the screen. And you know, it's been some quite some time since we had our last webinar. So once again, thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. And if you'd like to learn more, if you'd like to join our future webinars and programs, please feel free to Look, find for more upcoming events in e27.co backslash events or by signing up for an e27 account to get updated with Daily Digest. Once again, I'm Joel. Thank you so much for attending and thank you to our panelists and moderator for the very insightful discussion. Stay safe and hope to see you in our next events. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.